I'm David Weinberger. I write about the effect of the internet on ideas, how we think about ourselves in our world. I'm a researcher at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society, and I'm a, a co-director of the Harvard Library Innovation Lab at Harvard Law School, which is, which is where we are. David, uh, most of the ones in the community know you with the Clue Train Manifesto and as a bestseller book author of Everything is Miscellaneous. Can you give me a brief summary what what you're talking about hmm. or writing about? Um, well, okay. So uh, I generally I, I write about the effect of the internet on how we think about ourselves, how we think about our world, sometimes how we think about business. Clue Train, which was 10 years ago and I'm a co-author of was um, a fairly early book about the the net's effect on business especially um, when it comes to uh, businesses old assumption that they could sort of control and manage their environments their customers their, and their employees by selectively releasing information the business knew best about its products and so forth um, but once the net happens, then customers actually are talking with one another, and it turns out customers are the best source of information. And it's taken a long time for businesses to realize that the power that that old information gave them, that that power has slipped away from them, and now customers have that power. I think that's been obvious to people on the net for the past 15 years, but it's been very hard for many businesses to accept that. The Clutary Manifesto was published 1999 with, I think, 95 theses or arguments. Like, did there a lot change? You probably had last year an anniversary edition. What were the major changes? Well, a lot of what Clutrain um, was very excited about enthousi and, and enthusiastic about, um, those changes are now just taken for granted, which is great, is the way that it should be. I think that. Um, the essential insight of Clue Train was right, and it was. We felt at the time that we were saying what everybody on the web knew. We hoped we were articulating it well. But, um, I, that has remained uh, right, and I, that is the that the net is primarily about us getting together to talk with one another and to connect with one another. It's not primarily about businesses selling us stuff, although that's good too. So that insight, I think is at the heart of Clue Train was right then and with the rise of social networks is I think more true than ever. Uh, Clue Train 10 years ago was fairly obnoxious in how it talked. Mm -hmm. It was as if being on the net was a revolutionary act and now it's not, a, it's just you're all, everybody's on the net. Um, so the, the tone of Clue Train I think now is pretty off. But, um, but in part that's because the sorts of things that it was talking about turned out to be right and everybody is on the net and we are connecting so and what are you working on right now uh, i'm just finishing a book about the internet's effect on uh, knowledge what happens when knowledge goes from being something that gets put into books and gets printed and is the domain of experts to knowledge being something that exists and lives and is shaped by a network Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're pretty substantial changes. What are your questions behind that? Um, it's more of an exploration um, because the topic of knowledge is itself, the book is called Too Big to Know right? and mm -hmm. the idea is that um, knowledge, there's always been too much for us to know so we've had a strategy for dealing with that which is based around our tools which were paper and books yeah, physical tools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the basic strategy in that world is that you have to reduce the amount. You have to just put aside everything that isn't worthy because you only have so much room on your shelf or in your library. Um, well, in the digital age, the Internet is basically infinite in its capacity to hold information. And so our old strategy um, isn't good enough. It doesn't scale up, doesn't work at the size of the internet, so we're coming up with new strategies, new basic strategies um, for knowledge. So it turns out that theme itself is way too big for one book to, um, to conquer. So the book that I've ended up writing is much more of, a, of an exploration of some aspects of it. 
When I Google you on Wikipedia, I find on Wikipedia that everything what is the connection between technique and humanity interests you. What do you think uh, which is a threat or also the opportunity in your eyes that the internet brings to us? Well, that's It's you know, a very general question. It is a very general <laughs> question. So, um, it seems to me that the internet, uh, and in particular the web on top of it, is about links. That's mm -hmm. what makes it into a net in the first place, is that think nodes are connected, and hyperlinks make it extremely easy for anybody to do that sort of connecting. Um, and you do it in public, that is, it's the links that you make are available to others, and so we get this ever-growing mass of linked of links, and those links themselves have value. Linking is a very different way of connecting than we were able to do in mm -hmm. the physical world or through uh, paper, mm -hmm. um, or through telephones, or through TV and the other media that we've had. This is a radically new way of connecting. So anything that humans do that involve connecting with other humans gets changed and sometimes transformed. And it turns out that everything that humans do that's interesting is about connecting with other humans. Yeah. But we are still living in a three-dimensional uh, physical world. Uh, like, does the hyperlinking from the internet, do you see this also somehow manifest in society itself? Well, sure, because there is only one world, right? Okay. I'm, and we're living in it. And part the of it. The landscape of the internet is another one than from the real physical world. Well, but it's still part of one world, mm -hmm. right? It, it's, it certainly feels like its own type of space, um, and it's a type of space with very different rules, rules in which I think more of what is essential about humans can emerge. Um, so, for example, if you say, as seems clear to me, that um, it's essential to humans that we are in relationship with other humans, that we're primarily communities, not primarily individuals, that we're primarily connected, and you have now a realm, the Internet, where we can connect much more freely, that feels much more human. And when you remove the obstacles to connecting, things like space, uh, for example, um, then you begin to see how we would have, how humans would connect if many of the ob obstacles dropped away. And I think mm -hmm. in some ways that's a more realistic picture of what mm -hmm. it means to be human than what we are able to do in this poor, difficult, physical world that we live in. But there is only one world. So yes, of course, changes in how we connect digitally or how we communicate in general have effects in the world overall. So as a philosopher and expert on the internet, what is in your opinion, what are the major threats and also the opportunities that you see for the next 10 years in the future? Uh, well, the threats come from, unfortunately, come from the, some of the most powerful institutions in the world, including governments and large commercial uh, institutions who fear the openness of the Internet. And in some cases, for good reasons, uh, there are security issues, um, but often um, for bad reasons, for greed or because of fear that your business is um, inappropriate for what the net offers. And, I hardly dare to ask you, but are there any examples? And if can, what can I do as an individual like uh, against these threats? Uh, examples of threats? Well, there's copyright law that is wildly wrong for the Internet and probably wildly wrong off the Internet too, but that needs to be modified drastically so that um, there is much more open, uh, the possibility of much more open uh, exchange and reuse. Not to get rid of all of copyright, but to rewrite it in a way that makes sense for a connected digital world. That discussion in the governments of the world is going entirely in the wrong direction. It's serving a narrow set of commercial interests rather than a broad set of cultural interests. Governments can change this, but what can I do as an individual? Um, well, you can affect your government, at least mm -hmm. in theory we can, right? So that's a, one thing to do. Um, another is to be as uh, to build the net up by being as generous as you possibly can with the material that you put out and with the linking that you do and with the um, uh, connect the connections that you build. Because if we build a firm enough web, it will be uh, of deep, rich connections that matter to us. So it will get harder and harder for, uh, to disrupt those. Although it's that's still a genuine danger. And there, you know, I, I personally would stay away from companies that are. Um, imposing restrictions that don't feel like they're good for 
the web. Uh, the easiest example is Apple's App Store, mm -hmm. where the manufacturer decides what goes on your communication device, on your computer, on your iPhone. Um, and see, Apple, can I somehow bypass this? Well, you can jailbreak your phone. Uh, Apple has just announced that they're doing an App Store for the Mac. Um, unlike for the iPhone, the that one uh, you'll be free to use software outside of it. On the iPhone, Apple really does not want you doing that. Um, that sort of uh, imposition where a, some other company, some company decides what you should be doing with your devices is at least troubling. Mm -hmm. If I want to follow you uh, about your publications and what occupies you, do you also blog? Do you have an own website? Um, yes, I've been blogging for, I think, over 10 years now. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I've been blogging for a long time. Um, that's The site is called Joho the Blog. That's all one word. Mm -hmm. uh, no underscores. It's J-O-H-O the blog dot com. What does it stand for? Back in 1995 or so, um, jo I, had a, I wrote a little free newsletter I'd send out over email because that's what you use. You didn't use mm -hmm. the web that much then. And, um, I was writing about the effect of hyperlinking on organizations, so the newsletter was called Journal of the Hyperlinked Organization. Joho, J-O-H-O. -O. <laughs>